much seeking for knowledge in these latter times. The sons of Adam are now as busy as ever with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, shaking the boughs of it, scrambling for the fruit. Well, I fear many are unmindful of the tree of life. And though there are now no angels with their flaming swords to frighten men away from that tree of life, yet the way that leads to it seems solitary and untrodden. Yet there are many that eat of the tree of knowledge. There are many large volumes written about Christ, thousands of theological controversies discussed, infinite problems concerning his, his divinity, his humanity, and how the two work together and whatnot, so that our bookish Christians that have all their religion and writings and papers, they, they think they know Christ. And when they see all their papers lying about them, they, they think they have a good stock of knowledge and cannot possibly miss the way to heaven. As if religion were nothing but a little book craft, a mere paper skill. And many think that they know Christ for their confession of the creed and catechisms like parrots. They please themselves by violently opposing others for their beliefs and apprehensions. They lock up heaven with the private key of this and that opinion. If they can only argue and dispute about Christ, they imagine themselves to be great in the knowledge of the gospel. But the gospel is not merely a letter within out us but a quickening spirit within us. Ink and paper can never make us Christians, can never make a new nature, a living principle in us, can never form Christ or spiritual things in us. There are many that understand the Greek and Hebrew of the Scriptures that yet never understood the language of the Spirit. Words and syllables are but dead things. They cannot convey the living notions of heavenly truths to us. Cold theories and syllogisms, dry and dull disputes, could never of themselves beget the least glimpse of heavenly light, not the least sap of saving knowledge in any heart. All this, all this is but the groping of the poor, dark spirit of man after truth, to find it out with his own endeavors, and feel it with his own cold and benumbed hands. Now, I do not speak against the improvement of the rational mind, which is a noble and gallant thing. But what I do speak against is the dispiriting of the life and vigor of our religion by dry speculations, making it nothing but a mere dead skeleton of opinions to be argued over, a, a few dry bones without any flesh and sinews. Christ, Christ did not come into the world to fill our heads with mere speculations, to, to kindle arguments and disputes, to cause angry and peevish debates among us. No, Christ was a teacher of life, not school. The best Christian, the best Christian is the one whose heart beats with the truest pulse toward heaven, not he whose head spins out the finest cobwebs. He that truly follows his conscience is more a Christian, even though he never heard of Christ, than he that knows all the vulgar articles of the Christian faith and yet plainly denies Christ in his life. Hence, we must not judge our knowing of Christ by our skill in books and papers and doctrines and disputes, no, but by our keeping of His commandments. It will not profit us to believe that Christ was born of a virgin, unless God begets Christ 
within us. It will not profit us to believe that Jesus died upon the cross unless the old man of sin is crucified in our hearts. God Himself cannot make me happy if He is only outside me. No, not unless He enters into my soul and remakes it in His own likeness and goodness. Without obedience to Christ's commandments, without the life of Christ dwelling within us, then regardless of whatever opinions we entertain of Him, Christ is only named by us. He is not known. For holiness is nothing else but God stamped upon the soul. We may tremble and be afraid when we hear of fire and brimstone outside us. Well, in the meantime, we nourish within our own hearts a true and living hell. And as for heaven, we may only gaze abroad at it, expecting that it should come to us from above, and yet... We never look for the beginnings of it to arise within us. Every true saint carries heaven about with him in his own heart. Many of us may go to meet our Maker and say, Lord, Lord, I have prophesied in your name. I have preached many a sermon for you. I've been very active for your cause in the church. But alas, we shall receive no response from Christ but this, I know you not away from me. We may outwardly seem to be doing things. Friends, we are always about doing this or that good deed. We may make a great deal of noise and raise a great deal of dust with our feet, but we do not move from the ground on which we stand. We do not go forward at all. Or if we do, we sometimes make a little progress, but then we quickly stumble back again and lose the ground which we'd gained. Like Sisyphus in the fable, we roll up a mighty stone with much ado, sweating and tugging up the hill, and then we let it go again. Down, down, down. When I speak of holiness, when I speak of living in the likeness of Christ and His commandments, I do not mean the mere performance of outward duties of religion, coldly acted out as if they were a task with just the appearance of doing things. Nor do I mean a constant praying, fasting rituals multiplied one upon another. No, I mean an inward principle of divine life that enlivens and quickens the dead carcass of our outward performances. I do not urge here the dead law of outward works, which subjects us to a state of bondage, but rather, I urge the inward law of the gospel, the law of the spirit of life, than which nothing can be more free. For it does not act on us by a principle outside us, but is an inward self-moving principle living in our own hearts. They that act only by an outward law are like little puppets that skip nimbly up and down and seem to be full of life. But all the while, they are moved artificially by wires and strings from without and not by any principle of motion from within. Yet they that act by the new law of the gospel, by the law of the Spirit, they have an inward principle of life within them. And that law within that I speak of is the law of love. Let us really declare that we know Christ within by our keeping of His commandment, love one another as I have loved you. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and whoever loves is born of God and knows God. 
Oh, divine love, the sweet harmony of souls, the music of angels, the joy of God's own heart, the very, the very darling of his bosom, the source of true happiness, the pure quintessence of heaven. Oh, O oh, divine love, that which reconciles the jarring principles of the world and makes them all chime together, that which melts men's hearts into one another. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let us express this sweet, harmonious love in these jarring times, that so, if it is possible, we may tune the world at last into better music. Let us follow truth and love. And of the two indeed, it is better to fail in conveying a speculative truth than to fail to love. Truth and love are two of the most powerful things in all the world. And when they both go together, they cannot be easily withstood. The golden beams of truth and the silken cords of love twisted together will draw us on. Let us take heed. We do not sometimes call zeal for God and His truth that which is nothing else but our own tempestuous and stormy passion. For true zeal is a sweet, heavenly, and gentle flame which makes us active for God, but always, always within the sphere of love. It never calls for fire from heaven to consume those that differ from us in their beliefs. No. Let the soft and silken knot of love and true zeal tie our hearts together, even when our heads cannot meet, even when we do not say, share the same beliefs and apprehensions. And when all these things do come to pass, then shall Christ be set upon his throne indeed. Then shall we be a people acceptable to God. Acceptable and dearly, dearly loved. <laughs>